I'll talk a little bit about second measure and what we do there in a little bit, um, but I'm going to jump right into it. So this talk is kind of in the area of, of business analysis, um, and it's all about kind of what happens when you stop thinking about business results as being a flow of dollars and, just, and start thinking about them as being flows of dollars that are attached to customers um, and analyzing those customers directly. And it's kind of about some, some non-obvious things that happen when you analyze your data in that way um, and some, some tools which have kind of evolved over time for dealing with them. Um, as an outline, uh, it's, it's, it's going to mostly be about the models, um, but we're going to sort of first set up the framework. Um, second of all, look through a little bit of data to get some, some in intuition about, um, about these models. And then we're going to talk through the models and then look at some more results. And uh, if, you, um, if you are interested in sort of following along, don't worry. I'll, I'll put, I will post these slides up on my GitHub, which is github.com slash b11z. Um, because my name is B followed by 11 letters followed by Z. Um, so to start with, uh, we uh, need to kind of frame the questions we want to ask. Um, and so the caveat here is that this is myself as a data scientist and former software engineer presenting on corporate finance basics. So uh, it's going to get a little weird. Um, but this is kind of the, the smallest bit of domain knowledge that we're going to need to make sure that we're answering and asking and answering the right questions. So I think this kind of starts with like w w asking the question of uh, what happens when you set the unit of analysis to be a customer. Um, and we're going to talk through kind of the accountant's perspective on that. And so you start thinking about all the uh, cash flows that are associated with that customer. So when they spend with you, you see their purchases. Those come to, come to you as revenue. Um, you're spending money to buy or build the, uh, the things that you're selling. And that's referred to as cost of goods sold. <clears throat> More holistically than that, um, you're going to think uh, about all the costs that are associating, associated with serving that customer. So those are called vari variable costs in accounting. This is like everything that scales up as your customer account scales. Um, and maybe the final one is uh, that you're also spending up money upfront to find these customers. So you're, you're spending on marketing or something like that. That's referred to as customer acquisition cost. Um, so you kind of you spend that. You, find how much that you spend on marketing, you'll take that cost, you'll divide it by the number of customers that you manage to find, and then you'll sort of apportion that cost to each of those customers. Um, and so this is called customer acquisition cost, or, or if you want to sound cool, you can call it CAC. So this is how I kind of think of that in plot form. Um, this is just uh, you know bar chart where uh, the y-axis is um, positive if money is coming into the company, and negative if money is going out of the company. Um, and so you've got the revenue in red, and then everything you're spending on that customer in, in uh, below. Um, and this is how I think about it, but I'm not really crazy about this plot because you can't see much. So maybe here's a different way of looking at that. This is uh, plotted as a waterfall. So this just means that the y-axis is now a cumulative sum, and we can see things ticking up if the cash is coming in, and things ticking down as if cash is going out to the business. So um, with that way of kind of seeing things, I want to define this term of customer lifetime value. Um, to do that, uh, we're going to need to add something, and we're going to need to remove something from that chart. So the thing that we're going to have to add is this concept called uh, net present value or discounting, um, which we I'm going to have to gloss over. It's like kind of an in-depth topic, but it's a really common corporate finance framework um, that you'll see everywhere. Um, and the, the key thing is that we're trying to take all these cash flows that are spread out over time and sort of reframe them for analysis today. Um, and we're going to do that in a way where we're, we're adjusting each of those costs for the risk and the each of those cash flows for the risk and the opportunity cost um, of being in the future. And so you can kind of see that here. There's a, there's a formula, and then you can see the cash these bar amounts getting smaller and smaller over time. That's not because your cash flows are getting smaller and smaller over time. That's because this, like, this discounting we're doing, this risk adjusting that we're doing is making them smaller and smaller over time. So that's just a kind of way to take a bunch of cash flows and summarize them in one number. Um, and with that, with that piece of terminology, then we can define customer lifetime value. So customer lifetime value is, I'm going to define it as, it's just the revenue over, over the customer's lifetime minus all the variable costs, including the cost of goods sold, and then using this net present value framework to discount. <coughs> and it does not include customer acquisition costs. And so the, the whole purpose of this metric is just to summarize everything that's contributed by a single customer down to one number, one, one single metric. Um, and one thing to highlight is that you may find inconsistencies in the real world about the definition of this thing. Uh, so, so we've excluded customer acquisition cost. 
Um, some people may include it. Uh, and the, the key point I want to make there is just that, like, in general, when you talk about metrics, just, just define what you're talking about. Um, at the end of the day, maybe the words don't matter, but what matters is, th is that we're all clear on what we're talking about. Um, and uh, and the, the key reason for that is in pursuit of internal consistency. It's like, in general, um, when we want to analyze data and make some conclusion about, let's say, margin, we want to make sure that we're accounting for every component of margin one and only one time in our analysis. And so naming things helps you get to that goal of internal consistency. So that is to say, whatever, whatever you define, if you want to call it CAC or, or CLV or whatever, just um, uh, define the term that you're talking about. Um, and my, my second pro tip is if you want to sound cool, don't call it CULV, because I don't think anybody abbreviates it that way. So cool. So um, with that all sort of like in the background, um, we're going to start looking at some real data. To do that, I have to talk about where I work. Um, I work at Second Measure. I'm a data scientist there and head up the data team. Um, and what we do at Second Measure is we analyze billions of credit card transactions to answer real-time questions about consumer behavior. Um, these are, we leverage that, our data to answer questions like this. So these are some examples of things we've done. The one on the left is an analysis we put together of retention in the meal kit industry. Um, the second one is something that we looked at about uh, regional variation in um, food delivery companies and about how they can, certain companies can be very concentrated in, very market, in certain markets. And then the last is an analysis we put together of um, delete Uber and its effect on, on retention at um, Lyft and Uber. Um, we, and as a company, we deliver this as a self-service analytics platform to our clients. So um, that's second measure, and so f for reasons um, that, that are hopefully obvious, uh, we're, we're going to be analyzing credit card transaction data, and so we're pretty much going to focus only on the revenue side of the equation um, and not on the cost side. Uh, and this is not the whole of business analysis, but it's a hugely important part of it. And so everything that, that um, comes from now, we'll just be looking at revenue. So uh, cool. Um, so. Uh, <clears throat> I want to start by sort of looking at some data. Um, we're, I, I picked a company to look at. The company I picked was, was Dollar General. Um, Dollar General is a chain of variety stores uh, for, that started in Tennessee. Um, they focus on rural areas. Uh, for the longest time, they had the strategy of building stores where places like Walmart wouldn't build stores. Um, and have been pretty successful at that. Um, and fun fact, they also own DG.com after winning it in a bidding war against Dolce & Gabbana. Um, so uh, we're going to look at this metric called that I'm going to call lifetime spend. So I'm going to try to do that thing where I define my metric. Um, so lifetime spend will be gross cumulative sales, including taxes. Um, we're not going to be using this discount or net present value framework, and we're not going to net out any costs. Um, and we're uh, um, sorry. Our, uh, so our analysis will kind of generally start with raw data. Raw data is going gonna, is gonna to look like this. So um, here, every dot is a purchase. Um, and we've got just time on the x-axis. And then every row on the y-axis is a different customer. And we're going to calculate lifetime spend by uh, taking all those customers, aligning them by the day of their first purchase, calculating cumulative spending to date over time, um, and then averaging across all the customers. So that's, this, this is what this kind of looks like if we do this for Dollar General. So you can see that they spend, customers spend $20, $20 um, to begin with on average. And then over time, over three years, it's going to sort of, sort of slowly march up to around $200. Um, and when I, when I first started looking at these kind of plots and looking at Dollar General, I didn't really have great in instincts for what this chart would look like. So I looked at, I built this, and then I said, like, yeah, OK. Um, but. Uh, the truth is, is when you look at this, you probably won't see uh, lines that look this straight. So um, this actually kind of gets at what makes Dollar General spe special is that they're remarkably sticky. They retain really well, um, even in the Amazon and Walmart era. Um, and uh, so to sort of like make that clear, um, we can look at some other companies. So uh, on the top left, we've got Stitch Fix. Um, so Stitch Fix is a subscription clo clothing box. Um, as you can see, uh, they have a much higher lifetime spend than Dollar General, um, which, is, which makes sense. Stitch Fix is pretty far upmarket from Dollar General. Um, but you also see this kind of 
typical curve shape. Um, and that curve is ca caused by churn. So, so at, at a company like Stitch Fix, um, on day zero, they're going to have a very large customer base. And then over time, those some of those customers are going to get tired with the service and cancel. And so over time, their, spend, their spending will kind of decelerate on average because the, the, spend, the spend is being supported by a smaller and smaller number of customers. So that's kind of, you, you'll, you'll see that in a lot of the data. Um, another example is that I dug up is Wayfair. Uh, Wayfair is an online fur furniture retailer, and the interesting thing here is only that their customer sp lifetime spend is very front-loaded. So you can see it at $200 initially, and then ticking up very slowly from there, um, which is actually kind of a problem for Wayfair. Um, so yeah, so this is this is lifetime spend for Dollar General. This is kind of one kind of what we want to want to reason about. So um, the question comes like, why are we not done? Why is this talk not over? And the answer comes with something that I kind of failed to mention the first time I walked you through the metric that we were going to compute, uh, which is basically that um, anytime we want to align our customers by that first date and then calculate average spending, we're forced to ignore all the customers where we don't have enough data yet. Um, so all those plots that we were just looking at, we were ig ignoring all of our customers that were three years and younger, which is kind of unsatisfying. So um, that kind of hints at, at the key, which, the, which is the hard part of analyzing customer lifetime value, which is just the tricky nature of dealing with partially observed data. So to come back to this diagram, um, I mean, my job is a, is a, as a data scientist, and I think of it as my job to empower decisions. Um, and the truth is, you almost never make decisions in business with a plot that looks like this. Most of the time, you're making decisions based on a plot that looks like this. And so you've got today, and all data past today is grayed out, and you don't know it, and you're, you're forced to make decisions about what to do about this customer. Um, if you're a marketer, or you work in growth, your life is even harder. Um, you're actually going to be reasoning about hypothetical customers and their hypothetical customer acquisition cost, and then balancing it against this lifetime value that you don't know yet. So that brings us to these models, which is kind of a way to deal with this problem. Um, our, our approach is going to be fairly simple. So um, we're going to, going back to our raw data, uh, we're going to take all of our observations, all of the, our, our, our observed data, and build a model on top of them. And then we're going to use that to, for all of the data that comes beyond this black line, um, all the future data, we're going to use it to impute. So we're going we're to use that model and fill in essentially everything past this black line with expectation values. And then we're going to be able to analyze the, data, the combo of those two data sets, the real data and the expected future data together. <coughs> so um, to do that, so pur customer purchase data is, is fairly multifaceted. Um, and so to do this, we're going to inevitably have to factor this big problem into independent subproblems. And so you've got purchase counts, you've got churn, you've got transaction amounts, you've got all these costs. Um, and so to start with, we're going to focus almost exclusively on, uh, on purchase counts. And uh, when, I, when I encounter a problem like that, uh, one thing I like to ask is, what is the simplest thing that could work? Um, and so, you know, what is the simplest thing that might work for events in, over time? Um, hopefully the answer is, is uh, fairly obvious. It's a, it's a Poisson process. This is kind of like your classic first assumption that you might, might make. A Poisson process is just a memoryless process. Um, and so you can, you can kind of make this assumption. You can fit a uh, Poisson process to, to customer purchase data. You can look at how well it fits. Um, and the answer is, is it's a pretty bad fit. Um, and the reason is kind of hidden, hidden in this pictogram. So anybody want to guess what this says? French fish isn't necessarily like butter. Fr <laughs> that's, a, that's very close. So poisson, AKA French fish, <laughs> do, doesn't churn. Um, that's a butter churn. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so, um, so yeah, Poisson process is just going to keep going until infinity, right? Um, whereas people churn out. So, so this is just kind of a fact about our data, uh, is that people will be very engaged with your business, um, and then one day they'll just disappear. And you know, maybe they went to a competitor, maybe they got tired with the space, whatever it be, whatever it be they're going to churn. Um, and so we're going to have to expand our model and find a way that fits data. And so I'm going to sort of describe one common approach to doing that. And, th and the way that this is going to work is that we're going to make some assumptions about some latent processes that are un unobserved. And then we're going to, uh, those, those processes are going to add up to, to our observed data. And so up top, we're going to have a Poisson process. 
Um, and that Poisson process is going to be filtered through this birth-death process where, where after this death event, um, all of the hypothetical purchases are going to be truncated in our observed data. So down below the line, this is what we're going to see. Um, and the term uh, birth-death process here kind of comes from survival analysis and is just kind of a code name for this form of assumption where we, there's something that sort of starts, starts the clock uh, and then after that clock has started, you're at risk of dying over time or some event happening over time, but that event can only happen once. And so uh, that's kind of a, um, a, a fairly familiar set of assumptions. And so we're going to hybridize this survival process and this Poisson process to get to our, our data. Um, so you can write down a probabilistic model and you can write down the likelihood of this observed data given that those assumptions. Um, and then we just observe, uh, infer back from observed data to parameters. Um, we're going to get back two parameters. So the first parameter we're going to get is uh, the rate parameter of this Poisson, which is essentially the expected number of purchases per unit time, um, conditional on this person not churning out of the data. Um, and then the second number we're going to get is this hazard rate, is, which is essentially like a probability per unit time of this person churning. Um, and so you can kind of combine those two estimates about a customer and you get this, this curve here, which is kind of our, our estimate that this person has churned, um, conditioned on the data that we observed at the bottom. And so we, we know this person was alive or unchurned until their very last purchase. And after that, we have two possible explanations. Either they're just taking a break or they've churned. And so this likelihood is going to kind of balance those two hypotheses and go down over time, where we become more and more, more, and more certain that they've churned out. So this kind of hints at, at, at the game plan, is how we're going to factor the problem, which is that we're going to model transaction count and churn jointly, um, and then we're going to deal with everything else separately, uh, factor those out. So when I first saw this formulation, um, I was actually a little skeptical that this whole joint mechanism was actually necessary. So I kind of want to ask the question again, like, is this really the simplest thing that might work? Um, to illustrate that, uh, I've just got some toy data here. So this is just hypothetical purchase data for, um, for one customer. And so this customer has purchased six different times and those six purchases happened on three separate days. And um, you know, we can kind of just compute an average transaction count over those three observ observations and get two. And the question is, is this what really what we expect for their going forward purchase rate? Um, and I think the answer is no. Uh, I kind of intentionally set this up to be a bad, bad approach. Um, Two is an overestimate here, and the reason is because we're ignoring the negative space. You know, so they, they, there were these zeros, these days on which this person didn't purchase, and we're ignoring those in our average, and so we're overestimating the rate. And this may sound like a you know, fairly, uh, fairly simple mistake to make, but every time I go to analyze data, I'm going to make this mistake. So just, just caveat emptor. Um, but so, so with that in mind, maybe we can sort of fix that bug and. Uh, compute a mean where we're not ignoring these zeros. And so the question is, is this one that we get after doing that, um, is this correct? Um, and the answer is a little more subtle, but the answer is that this is still an overestimate of their purchase rate. And the reason is because we've, there's actually a little more negative space that comes after their last purchase. So their last purchase um, may not be the true date on which they, they churned out according to, according to this model. <coughs> and so the amount of negative space that we're ignoring at the end uh, is, is going to cause us to like very subtly bias our estimate. Um, and the amount of negative space that we're ignoring is going to be very specific to that customer's purchase rate. Um, so it actually ends up depending on the data. And so this is kind of an illustration that the, the naive approach where we just sort of compute the empirical rate uh, over their observed purchases will overestimate the rate. And, and uh, this, this you know, sounds fairly benign, but is, is really pernicious. So, so uh, um, I did a simulation study to sort of, sort of um, estimate how bad this issue is. And I did it in a, in a setting where I know the true rate, and so I know how bad the bias is. Um, and the answer is um, it, <coughs> it, uh, it you know, gets fairly manageable as long as you're willing to bucket your data. Um, but you need to bucket your data to the point where you've got maybe one or two, um, one or two events per unit of time that you're bucketing. And uh, that'll get you down in this like six to two percent uh, uh, bias um, or overestimate rate. 
Um, and that's kind of a deal breaker for most realistic cir circumstances. So we analyzed thousands of companies at second measure and I looked at average purchase rates and this would mean that you're bucketing your data very coarsely and you're just getting sort of very coarse grained estimates about customer lifetime value. <clears throat> so yeah, that's, the, that's kind of the first big idea in these family of models uh, is that you can, you can build this hybrid likelihood um, that is composed from fairly familiar probabilistic building bo blocks um, and uh, the, kind of the name for these models is the counting your customers models, which is uh, named after the first paper that was kind of framed in this way. Um, so that's the first big idea. Um, the second big idea that you come across when you read these papers is this idea of customer heterogeneity. So I kind of want to um, describe that a little bit. So uh, to motivate that, I want to I want to actually calculate purchase rate um, for for dollar general for our data set. And so we're, ju we're just going to take, um, take all of our customers and we're going to compute the number of purchases and then we're going to divide by the number of days that we saw them for. Uh, and so that, that's here. And if we, uh, if we plot this out, we're going to get this plot for dollar general. This is, uh, each tick here is a different customer. And the first thing to, to kind of highlight here is that the, the variability is extreme. So uh, I've had to plot this on a logarithmic axis for it to fit. Um, and our data is spanning three full orders of magnitude um, in that plot. And so this is just kind of a universal fact is that your customers will span like a huge range of activity uh, for your business. Um, <clears throat> you know, another way of looking at that is to go back to this lifetime value plot. So if you're, if you're like me, uh, you, you made this plot and then you thought about people kind of in orderly fashion walking up this chart. But the truth is, is if, you, uh, if we overlay that all across the raw data, um, each line here being a different customer, uh, it looks way more disorderly. So, so there are a lot of customers who stay very close to the x-axis and essentially don't purchase or churn out immediately. And they're be be being balanced out by a very small number of high value customers. So that's kind of customer heterogeneity in a, in a nutshell. Um, but the, the, second, the second thing there uh, that I saw when I looked at this plot is what are these weird little syn synthetic striations on the right, right hand side of the data set. So like our data set looked so nice and normal and blobby and Gaussian. And then we saw these little ticks here. Like what are these? Like they look alien. It's like, is this Elon Musk? Like what is it? <coughs> um, and uh, to go back to the calculation that we're doing, um, I think the answer becomes pretty clear if, you, if we split this data out by that denominator there. Um, so if we look at how many days we saw that per person over, you can see that for people who we have a large history, um, we're going to very accurately estimate their true purchase rate. Whereas for people where we have very short histories, we're just going to be looking at pure noise. Um, that noise is, bo is both going to be um, you know, weird looking and also biased. Um, so, so that is kind of customer heterogeneity as it plays into the hard part of these models. Um, and so these models have a way of dealing with this um, which is to, which is multi-level modeling. Um, so I kind of want to motivate that idea. That's a very generic idea that comes up in a lot of places. Um, multi-level modeling, AKA hierarchical models, AKA random effects models or mixed effects models. Um, and so just, just to describe them quick, quickly, <coughs> you, um, you kind of set up a, an, you assume a, an explicit probabilistic plot, uh, process on your observed data. So you talk about a probabilistic, a stochastic process which is gonna, uh, gonna lead to your observations. Um, and then uh, because of that process, the models are able to be aware of the noise level that is going to be in data like this. Um, and, and so we're gonna deal with these small, sparsely observed customers by essentially crafting a prior. So in a Bayesian sense, we're going to um, shrink these estimates towards um, a reasonable prior. And the novelty of multi-level models is that that prior itself is motivated by the data. So we're, we, um, these models essentially jointly fit um, you know, the estimates per customer along with the prior, which is motivated by this uncorrupted data that we're seeing up on the top. Um, so that's kind of the key idea in multi-level modeling. Um, and I, I think of it as a, as a fairly powerful and ge general idea um, because it allows you to fit these richly perimeter parameterized models. So we're fitting uh, two coefficients per customer here, but still do sensible things in the area of your data where you have very few observations. 
So um, these models that we've been talking through, uh, there's a very good Python implementation of them called Lifetimes. Um, it's, it's, it was open sourced by Shopify and written by uh, Cameron Davidson Pilon, who's a data scientist there. Um, and so Shopify open sourced this to, because they've been using this internally to essentially do what we described of, of counting your customers and estimating their lifetime value. Um, it it impl implements a family of models. So these are all the counting your customers models, but there's a couple of them. Um, and I, if I can just kind of be opinionated, just pick the bottom one. So this is called the modified beta geometric negative binomial distribution model, or MBG NBD, which is just named um, from, from the parametric assumptions that we're taking on those probabilistic processes. Uh, and uh, uh, um, each model is gonna have a very slightly different story about uh, sort of data generating process story about how the data is generated, but, um, but they all have a very similar flavor. So this is just the MBG NBD model. Um, pro tip, nobody calls it the Umbaga Dibida model, but you know, yeah. <coughs> so, uh, so yeah. Um, uh, so next up, I, I wanted to sort of illustrate how you can use that, use those models. Um, to do that, we're gonna have to look at a new company. Um, so uh, I picked Bird. So Bird's a little more exciting than Dollar General. They're a scooter startup, the scooter, scooter share startup, as you're aware, um, out of Santa Monica. Um, so we can kind of start by making this lifetime spend chart for Bird. This is what it looks like. Uh, but this is really unsatisfying. So uh, we can only do 180 days because we have such a short history for Bird. Um, and to do that 180 days, I had to throw out 80% of their customers. And that's because Bird is growing like a rocket. So that's, that's really unsatisfying. Um, we can kind of band-aid that a little bit by going to cohorts. So this is what we would do if we just grouped all the data by grouped all the customers by the date of their first purchase and then had one of these lines for each of those cohorts. Um, but, and I like, these, I like these plots, but they're also really hard to read and very dangerous to show people because they will make conclusions on their own. So, um, <clears throat> so, so basically what we want to do is find some way to summarize this data um, and say something about birds, bird, the value of a customer at bird. Um, also, to illustrate this heterogeneity point, I actually did that, but I did that for the three regions that, um, that Bird is operating in. So they grew very early on in the west, um, but then later on exploded in the south as well. Uh, and so if we were trying to analyze and compare the south and the west, we would, we would ha run against the problem that this is a very different mix of customer vintages. So the average customer in the west is a lot older than the custom average customer in the south, so we have more data on them. So these models are essentially a way to um, analyze while controlling for that, that known difference. Um, so we can start by making this plot, um, this cohorted plot um, split by region. You can clearly see that um, lifetime value in the south is gonna be lower than, than in the west, um, but you can't really read it from the chart. Um, and so to do this, we, we can simply fit one of these models, um, use these models to, uh, to fit a uh, sort of um, uncorrupted estimate for every customer and then use, use those estimates to project out whatever we want. In this case, I projected out 24 month sales, uh, 20, 20, 24 mo four month total sales for, for Bird and uh, we got a 16% lower, uh, lower 24 month value for, for the South region than for the West. So for Bird, the takeaway is just that customers act differently. And you can't assume that new markets behave the same as proven ones, which is kind of another, another instance of this customer heterogeneity phenomenon. Um, so yeah, coming back to these models, like uh, um, it, it all, to me, it all comes back to like, why do we care about this chart? Um, and the reason to me is because I think this chart is central to tons of decision making in business. So, so it all, all, all reasons around like deciding what is going to happen, estimating what is going to happen to a group of customers, um, finding customers that uh, are expected to end up above the y-axis, hopefully well above the y-axis, um, and then operating your business in such a way that it stays there over time. So coming back to the ideas uh, that we, we talked through, so um, the first one is just that this, this workflow where you build models from your observed data and use it to project the future and then kind of analyze the combo of the two is, is fairly powerful in my opinion. And the second one is that probabilistic models um, can be a good way to tell a story about your data and then fit, fit models to that data. Uh, the third one is that heterogeneity abounds and, uh, and as a result, you have to kind of mine the noise in your data. 
And the fourth one is just to plea to define your metrics when you use them. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, these are some, uh, these are some references. So um, on, uh, we talked a little bit about corporate finance, and I'm a huge fan of Aswath Namodaran's lectures. He's a professor at NYU Stern and puts all of his lectures up online. Um, if you're interested in multi-level modeling, this is a great book. Uh, if you're interested in these models, um, check out Lifetimes and check out the blog that Shopify put out. Um, and then we talked briefly about survival analysis, and I just want to plug a talk from some former coworkers about that. Yeah, so that's it. Um, thanks so much. I hope this was, uh, this was kind of helpful in sparking some ideas that you'll get to use in your work. And uh, I work at Second Measure, and we're, we're hiring, um, as you can read here. But uh, that was pretty much it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, their their outlier effects. So, um, I mean, th that that is a good question. So we, uh, <clears throat> I mean, our goal in, at Second Measure is essentially to, you know, characterize what's going on on the ground. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I think we would yeah. we would think about the effects that we observe as being real in the sense that this this is the actual cash flow to the business. Um, but we could definitely be observing what's going on on their growth team. Um, but and to sort of know the impacts of what's going on on their growth team, we have to be able to essentially uh, estimate whether the customers that they've acquired are gonna have the same, you know, same value that all the other customers are. But if we can estimate that, then those effects are real. Those effects will propagate through the business, which is what we care about um, making conclusions about. Does that help? Yeah, I, I kind of like, so how would you address like helping that, that business help like actually um, know, like, um, for instance, when you're trying to uh, get new customers back and maybe you're sending them a deal. Uh, I feel like, so I've, I've worked on media mixed modeling, which is hierarchical modeling in that, that world, and you're trying to optimize your ad spend using data where you don't necessarily know if, like, Home Depot was having a promotion on mm -hmm. XYZ product. Um, and so you have to kind of figure out a way to make sure that you're not capturing those Effects. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I think um, we, you know, generally we're gonna try and help with breaking your data into subgroups and analyzing value among subgroup subgroups. But assessing causality within those subgroups is a very tricky question. So I think that's what you're getting at. Is I don't know that there are good solutions to that, um, other than to be defensive and careful. <laughs> uh, other questions? Down front. Oh. Yeah. Um, the, can you walk through again how you? Uh, you were using the West Coast for Bird, using the West Coast to estimate those other ones. Were you building a model or were you? No, so the approach that I took there um, was yeah. to, um, to essentially uh, fit separate models on the West and on the South. Um, so so um, completely un, un, uh, unpooled data. So the West will have one model and one estimate, and the South will have another model and another, another estimate. Um, you can also think of these as being covariates or features and so you can sort of extend the model so that it has covariates in there but here i just sort of like split that split the data set if that makes sense cool. how uh looking at the different regions and stuff how would you account for seasonal effects it's like i'm from the midwest and i can't imagine <coughs> Sure, sure. Well, I do wonder about that for bird. Like, I, I think we don't have enough data to see how it's going to play out in like really cold regions. But um, you know, the, the gist there is that um, <clears throat> you know these these models are essentially or the the frame point that you're going to the perspective you're going to take when you're analyzing the data this way um, is that you have some growth that's kind of an input or something that you would forecast um, that is going to be highly seasonal, and you're going to have to know about that that seasonality. Um, and then these models m care a lot about the retention, and so they care a lot about sort of like whether there are seasonal effects in retention. Um, and uh, you know, on the ground, you will observe seasonality and retention. Um, it's usually a lot more muted than than um, than acquisition, for example, um, customer. But uh, but I think maybe for a very weather-based startup like Bird, it might be um, seasonal, and we'll have to look at that. 
Um, and then if you wanted to account for that in these models, you would have to kind of do that covariate extension. So you would have to have like uh, that, that probability of churning being able to depend on the season of the year, essentially. Cool, maybe one more? Yeah. Um, so you, you, you model their spend uh, as a typical summer. I mean, never shifted. You know, just thinking like, well, I mean, if I start test stock purchasing some, I need to like tail off and purchasing toward the end. That seems like a, like a great statistical assumption. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So um, yeah, and, and just to be clear, we're modifying, we're modeling their uh, their purchase events, like the times of those events or the frequency of those events, as Poisson, um, and then we essentially need a separate model to estimate uh, the um, purchase amount conditional on purchasing. You know, uh, and so I didn't really get into that here, but there's this like model that's common in the same literature called the gamma gamma model, which is yeah um, a uniform assumption of purchase amounts. Um, and I think, yeah, the, um, I think in reality, uh, for, for cases where you really want accurate, accurate sort of estimates, you, um, you do want to essentially, um, essentially go to a more complex model or a model that has like the ability to tie those two together. But part of the, part of the message here is that this is a very uh, multifaceted problem and you do have to kind of like assume independence somewhere. And so this is one of the places that they kind of do assume independence um, to make the to make the problem like not one giant joint estimation problem. Yeah.